I, I wouldn't recommend it. Um, I would not do that part over again, and I don't recommend others to do it either. It can be extremely stressful to figure out what you need to do to land a job and advance your career in the cybersecurity field. With so much information out there, it can be difficult to know who to listen to and what's actually required of you. Well, today's guest is going to make that a bit easier for you. He's the director of cybersecurity content at IE, and today we're going to talk about everything you need to know to start a career in the cybersecurity field. Please welcome Jack Reedy to the show. Welcome. Uh, do you mind taking a few minutes and introducing yourself for those who don't know all the great things you do for the community? So obviously my name is Jack Reedy, but I um, am also known as Sec IT Guy on uh, Twitter and all the other socials. I've spent the better part of the last two or three years trying to help others in enter the cybersecurity field because the opportunity wasn't really there whenever I was first coming up and I wanted to give back. Uh, with that, I've been um, working with i &E as the director of cybersecurity content to help build entry level and intermediate level content and work that's available for everybody to you know, take and jest in a popular way, as well as uh, working with the cyber and security group um, as a producer and also uh, on-air personality to, you know, teach threat hunting a couple times, stuff like that. Um, haven't been doing it much lately just because, you know, work comes first, but still available for mentorship opportunities in the community. Really quick, uh, before we get too started here, I want to mention, if you guys have any questions at all, make sure and drop them in the comments below and me, myself, or Jack, I'm sure will be more than happy to answer any one of those. So, yeah, let's let's kind of talk about your origin story. How did you decide cybersecurity was for you? So, I took a roundabout way into it and kind of stumbled. Actually, uh, I really wish that it was it was some you know determination or something. And I speed run this, but what actually happened was I left high school in 2006, right before the recession happened. And my career path was not well planned. I, I, I thought I would just go to college and, um, you know, win at life. And that did not happen. <laughs> I failed out. <laughs> um, and so I was bumming around uh, my hometown around 2008 whenever the recession was happening. And I was losing jobs left and right just because either the company would fold or they freezed all long-term hiring and I'm only allowed to be seasonal or whatever else. I, I think I went through four different companies in one year and I was tired of it. Um, so I did a Google search and I looked up the fastest growing jobs in the next five to 10 years. And a lot of them were nursing or medical related, which I knew required a degree that I couldn't get. Um, same with uh, law, legal, paralegal, things like that. And I couldn't do that, but there was a lot of IT jobs. And my thought process there was that was going to be the best way for me to enter into a career field. And I also had um, a little bit of history, you know, messing around with the family computer, constantly on board, stuff like that. So funny enough, a friend of mine um, suggested that I check out the military and I had no idea what I was doing. So I went to the Armed Forces Recruiting Center and I tried to go to the Air Force and their door was locked and their lights were off at two o'clock in the afternoon. <laughs> so <laughs> I went next door and I said, hey, when's your buddy going to be back? And he's like, he's not my buddy, but what are you trying to do? So I'm trying to get into IT stuff. He goes, well, hey, we got computers and we'll teach you how to defend yourself. So that's how I joined the Marines. Um, <laughs> and, oh. Yeah, that's, that's legitimately how I joined the Marines. And I went with a contract that was a technology option. Um, if you're not familiar with the Marines, it's kind of a, it's a lottery system as to whether or not you get the job you want. So I could have ended up a radio operator. I could have ended up at computers. Um, there, there was a lot of different things. Um, but I, I did end up getting the one that I wanted was computers. And then about midway through my career, I was coming up on um, about five years in, I, I was coming up on reenlistment or getting out. And as I started to look at getting out, I mean, I had been combat deployed twice and I didn't have any certs. I didn't have the opportunity to go to any follow on training. So all I had was this bundle of experience of about three or four years that I could say, hey, I did this. But without any certifications, how could I translate that into job skills for civilian world, right? So another friend of mine, my mentor at the time, looked at me and was like, you should probably do one more 
go around as far as your, um, you know, a, another reenlistment. But this time, focus on schooling, focus on education, try and get with a unit that will allow you to do that stuff. And again, I took a look at the fastest growing jobs and I saw cybersecurity was budding up. And I took a look at the opportunities in the Marine Corps and I went to my uh, monitor who's in charge of all of our career stuff. And I said, hey, you're starting up these uh, cyber protection teams up in Quantico. You know, I'm really, or uh, I think it was Fort Meade at the time. And I'm, I'm like, I'm really interested in that. He goes, uh, well, you can't go to the Fort Meade one. You don't have a top secret clearance. Um, I'll put you down on Virginia one, which I, I mean, I thought I was getting the short end of the stick, but at least I was getting to go somewhere I wanted to. Turns out that that was great because there was two teams there and I ended up working on both of them, helping them both stand up. And I got to travel the world doing uh, threat hunting basically at a bunch of different bases. Um, so I, I kind of just went head and feet first into just the, the deep end of cybersecurity, t not only training on it, but uh, with U.S. Cyber Command, but also teaching it for the people that couldn't make it to the course quite yet, so that way they could at least do something with us. Like, I, yeah, that, that's that's so cool, and um, I, I can really relate to that story. Um, I graduated high school in '08, mm -hmm. and um, and in high school, I was lucky enough. My high school had a CCNA course. You graduated nice. high school, you also had your CCNA certification, and that meant. I mean, not that it doesn't mean anything now, but that meant a lot back in the day. So like CCNA yeah. was like guaranteed job placement mm -hmm. but i didn't know what i wanted to do with my life and i kind of very similar just kind of bummed around got into production jobs and finally decided that i i want to do what i enjoy and got into the tech field way later but um you know eventually came back around and so i can understand it could be quite the struggle there now a lot of people will come to me and say i want to be in cybersecurity, and i'm like great what do you want to do in cybersecurity? I mean, cybersecurity <laughs> yeah. is such a broad term. And they just kind of look at me like, what, what do you mean? There's, there's different jobs in cybersecurity. You mind kind of talking about some of the different roles and different paths you can go into cybersecurity, you know, within just this big umbrella word. Yeah. Um, it's funny you mentioned that. Cause I bring that up a lot too of, you know, it's, it's easy to say, I want to be in cyber, but it's, when you ask, what do you want to do immediately? People start falling apart because they don't realize there are different jobs and that those jobs are pretty vastly different. Now, one, the hardest thing you're going to do in cybersecurity is get your first job. That that's going to be the most Absolutely. difficult thing you do. It helps when you know what it is that you want to do, or at least focus in on something that is a topic of, of, of conversation, because as an employer, we don't expect you to have, a rainbow knowledge of all aspects. And we also don't like to hear, you know, if you train me how to do it, then I can do it because that's the thing. If I could just train anybody to do it, then I would just ask for anybody to come do it. Right. Um, there is a foundational bit of knowledge that you need to have, and that's in technology, just how do networks work? What are servers? You know, what's a memory on a system, stuff like that. Then there are three paths that I, I basically like to call it three paths. Um, and that's engineering, um, offense and defense. So red team, blue team, technically yellow team. A lot of people don't refer to it as that. And then some of the specialty jobs that a lot of people like are the combination of those things. So if you want to be a threat hunter or, you know, a uh, discovery analyst, uh, that would be purple team, which is the combination of red and blue. If you want to work on, um, defensive engineering, as in making s security systems better, that would be green team, which is a combination of blue and yellow. Same with improving, um, you know, Im improving or doing bug bounties or improving hacking and stuff like that. Intelligence work, that would be orange. So it, it's, there's, there is an actual cybersecurity color spectrum that's out there that's been talked about in a couple different DEF CONs and people have expanded on it in authorships. So um, I'm not completely pulling this out of nowhere, but um, <laughs> um, with that, I would say that a lot of people make the mistake, I think, of thinking the only entry-level job is hacking, right? They want to be a penetration tester. And while that's a good goal to have and it's not impossible, I've known plenty of people who have done that, a lot of times people will actually get in and start doing the work in another field of cybersecurity and realize, I actually like this a lot better. 
you know, so a couple areas you can go into is if you're into engineering, that's building systems or system administration, uh, security administration, um, information security analyst, things like that, where you, basically you'll be doing a lot more either auditing or you'll be building systems that are secure or administrating security systems for larger companies. Um, you could also do SOC level one, which is an analyst role for, to see if the alerts that fire are actually alerts that are, you know, should be reviewed. Um, that has a pretty quick pathway into SOC level two, usually about a year or so, eight year to 18 months. And then, like I said, you know, a junior level penetration tester. A lot of times you'll find, I, I would argue that you would find a lot of the jobs in the engineering side of the house, you know, finding somebody to configure firewalls, maintain the the architecture with IT systems. And it's a really easy lateral move to go from IT to security if you go into those job roles, right? Because you're basically, you're still doing IT work, you're just doing IT with a security focus. And then you can also have things that are a bit more operations-based, which are like, like I said, the SOC analyst, where you're doing alert triage, uh, finding context, and then talking with the administrators to ensure remediation's happening, so. Absolutely. Um, you know, I, I hear, you know, a lot of people want to get into penetration testing and mm -hmm. yeah, I think they're, they're drawn to it kind of the, by the sexiness. Ooh, we're going to break into this building and stuff Hollywood, like that. Hollywood, yeah. Yeah. But I don't think most people realize that, you know, penetration testing is okay. You have probably about 10 to 20% of doing the actual work and the mm -hmm. rest of it, you're, you're writing reports, you're talking to, you're, you're training the people. Okay. This is how I got into this system. Yeah. You know, it's. So I think a lot of people want to do that. And then they, when they realize how much report writing and stuff is, is they're like, Oh, wait a minute. No, this isn't, this isn't cool anymore. <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah. Um, so yeah, I, I understand completely now, you know, you know, we, we talked about kind of the different roles, you know, what are some, you know, is it possible for someone just to jump straight into a cybersecurity role or do they really need to do that fundamental time in like a general it position? They don't have to. I, I've known plenty of people that have gone straight into cybersecurity after studying for, you know, six, six months to a year. That's not the most optimal path, I'll say, um, if you're trying to be efficient. Um, because, because people have done it, that, that is a path. You can do that path, right? I would recommend getting any job that you can get that is related to technology. If you are selling computer parts, if you are... Um, working on mobile phones, if you are work, like literally anything, because part of, part of our job as hiring managers, we have to establish that you have, have some form of work ethic. You can show up to a workplace on a day-to-day -day basis, you know? Um, now cybersecurity is one of those that you can do a mid career transition. I've known plenty of people who have gone from, you know, sales jobs or, uh, mechanics at dealerships, something like that. And they've pivoted hard, right. And gone and found their first job in technology after studying and hanging out with, a, you know, a bunch of people that are in the industry. Um, but you can also, like I said, I, I really recommend getting your first job in tech anywhere and don't undersell the value of having a background in a mobile phone. You know, you can, create an entire career just working in mobile development, mobile security, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. You know, there's, and I'm not saying you have to, if you start in mobile phones, that that's your entire career path. The thing is, is once you get your foot in the door for technology, it's a lot easier to branch out to whatever it is you want to do. Absolutely. So, so much. So, I mean, I, I say that all the time here on the channel, get that one to two years of experience on the help desk or just that entry level position. Mm -hmm. and then you'll realize so many doors will open up to you. You know, you can, you know, just countless possibilities. Once you kind of build that initial experience, you know, build that job ethic. And, you know, a key skill to learn is those soft skills, those communication skills. And I think doing that entry level job, whether it's, you know, Geek Squad or whatever, you're going to build those soft skills and communication skills that are really going to help you once you get into a cybersecurity position because. It, the level of communication is only going to increase um, and you're going to have to start talking about more technical things to less technical people. I feel mm -hmm. so. But yeah. I, I think that we can't undersell the need for customer service at every level because eventually you start talking to CFOs and CISOs and CEOs about multi-million dollar 
security programs. Like eventually you'll be – even even as an analyst, as a senior analyst, you'll still be talking to very powerful people like the legal team. Um, you know, I – so after the military, I, I was working at Sony uh, Music Entertainment and I was talking to, you know, uh, the CFO and the CLO, the chief legal officer, about – the uh, ability to break SSL encryption and the considerations that are involved with that for if, you know, data privacy and things like that, just as a, con you know, a consideration. Um, we would talk about data loss prevention and, you know, how do we make sure that we don't lose any customer records or this, that, and the other with the legal team, with the CFO, they're trying to implement a new security software solution and I'm there analyzing it and making sure that, you know, it can talk out to the world. So being able to communicate in that way and make sure that you're on your P's and Q's whenever, you know, you're, you're in that type of room, if you don't come from a business background, is also extremely important. Now, I feel the most popular track into cybersecurity is certifications. It seems like everyone wants to go out and get certifications. And, you know, there is several different ways to get cybersecurity, whether it's college education or certifications. But I feel, I don't know, correct me if I'm wrong, but I think certifications are kind of the quickest way to achieve that goal of getting that maybe first level entry level job in the field. What do you think about that? I think so. Um, I think that people also though have a little bit too much reliance on them. They feel that they have to get six of them before they can start applying for jobs yeah. or, you know, that they have to have this many or this development or this, that, and the other in order to get to this level before they're comfortable starting to figure things out. You know, it it really is about getting the job on the on the job experience. That I think that that's going to get you further. Now, to get in there, obviously, you do need certs, you of some sort. Um, and I would argue that certifications are probably better than a degree at this point, just because I've met. I, I once interviewed somebody, and um, I was looking for an entry level role to you know, test out some of the stuff at I and E. And as I'm interviewing this individual, they had just gotten out of school with their cybersecurity degree. And I asked them, what was your favorite cybersecurity project that you worked on? Couldn't answer me. No, no idea. <laughs> and it, it, just as I would say with the military, it's the same as a degree. If you're going to dedicate four years of your life to something, you know, like you need to make sure that you pull something from that. But I was talking to this individual and I, they couldn't communicate anything that they had learned about cybersecurity at all. And I, I don't mean like – because when you get into an interview, I'm not going to ask you how IPs work. I'm not going to ask you you know, what the best type of server architecture is or what a DMZ is. What I'm going to ask you is to describe projects you've worked on. What have you touched? What type of technology have you engaged in? You know, if you tell me that you've built a website from scratch using AWS with an S3 bucket, then I'm going to know that you're good at cloud, or at least you have some knowledge or understanding about it, right? Like there's either way projects that you can do by yourself, you can talk about, and then, and then having the certification to back it helps. I know that you've hit, at least at that point in your life, some form of a snapshot, right? No, and you know, I, I, I can, I understand and once again can relate, you know, Pre me, I don't come up from a cybersecurity background. I'm a director of network operations. I'm a networking mm -hmm. guy kind of through and through. But I have had experience in uh, cybersecurity. Like I, t I beta tested uh, INE's EJPTV2 certification. And coming from a guy who knows nothing about cybersecurity, I found it so fascinating learning how to use, you know, NMAP uh, a little bit deeper in a from a different angle using Metasploit framework. I've just found that so fascinating and fun. And, you know, I can attest to it as coming from a guy who doesn't do cybersecurity on a daily basis, you know, it's not my primary job role, is you really have to be able to have those hands-on experiences. So, you know, having having those certifications you know, often, you know, I, like I always recommend build a home lab, start testing some of the things you're learning and talk about those projects you're doing really goes a long way in the hiring process, I think. Well, yeah. So I also came up from a, when I was starting off as IT, I came up networking as well, kind of just a systems admin in general, but I did a lot of networking it was my bread and butter. I loved, you know, CCNA up until they asked me to memorize a whole bunch of different router types. <laughs> um, anyway. <laughs> Um, 
so if you told me that you know this particular network device was out let's just say uh, a layer three switch if you told me this layer three switch was out because i have that background and experience i would ask you so is that the trunk you know is that the trunk of the building or is that just a distribution level like what type of layer is it that we're talking about um, if you were to tell me what type of port it is, you know, giga versus, uh, e- you know, fast ethernet or whatever else I could, like, I can have a conversation with you about the impact that is going on because that technology device is out. Right. And I think that that type of stuff translates a little bit better whenever you have some form of experience in technology to be able to say, Hey, the server just got hacked okay, let's start drawing the context around this. Do we have regional location redundancy? You know, do we have X, Y, and Z type of backups? Or is this just our primary server? This is out. Our website is down, right? No, absolutely. Let's, I kind of want to dive into this a little bit more, you know, talking about certifications, you know, let's start. Do you mind kind of naming off some of the kind of entry level certifications you think people should be looking into depending on the different job tracks, you know, whether red team, blue team, are there any certifications that come to mind that people should start studying for? Red team. I really do recommend EJPT. I think, um, you know, Alexi, uh, Josh Mason both worked very hard. Alexi Ahmed, um, hacker exploit over on YouTube. Um, Josh Mason as well worked really hard to build that up um, into something. It's that a very works. cool certification. Yeah. You know, I'm it's really coming from someone who completely bombed it. I can say that <laughs> was one of the coolest certifications and exams I've done in a long time. Yeah, I, I, I really recommend that one. Um, I think we've worked out all the bugs and I think it's, uh, it's really good. Um, and that would be for red team penetration testing to get, you know, foot in the door. Um, can't, can't, you know, uh, ignore comp tia sec plus really can't it is a, it it is a, a federally recognized um a lot of individual companies and it, you know um recognize it as well uh we have our own version coming out which is called eda uh enterprise defense administrator so um looking to see how much the uh you know what the public's views are on that once it fully hits the platform um also you know, for entry level, I would say that if you want to go into engineering, take a look at, I've seen CISA before, but the problem with CISA is it can be a little bit intimidating and intermediate. I've known people that don't have a background that have been able to study very hard and get that one. I would say that that is between like SEC plus and CISSP is CISA that falls right in between there, um, which is CISA by the way. Um, from a blue team perspective, um, we have we have the ECIR, but again, that's also a little bit of an intermediate one. Um, we're developing now something that might be beginner, coming in 2024, um, working on that. Then we also have, um, oh, I'm going to get smacked here. I can't remember. <laughs> it, I, it's a security blue team, blue team level one certification for an entry level. I think that 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 from what I've seen of that cert, that is a, um, a great cert as well. Not as widely, uh, not as widely recognized, uh, by companies yet. Um, I would recommend again, get your comp to sec plus with that, but it is an entry level certification aimed at that, you know, SOC level one job as well. Um, Oh, you guys do offer training for the security plus on your platform. Well. We do. Well, we have, we have training that's like security plus again. Um, you know, we have coverage for entry level as well. Um, yeah. So uh, we, we have training that you can take for that, but for the search themselves, yes. Sec plus yes, and absolutely. blue team level one. If you can manage to do ECIR, I think that that one isn't a great one because you do have to write a full instant response report, but that's, yes is technically an intermediate level certification because you're, you know, you're doing a full instant response analysis. Usually the job of a, uh, SOC level one analyst is to just figure out whether or not the alert was correct <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> and then move on from there. Um, but yeah, I, so I think a lot of these are good starting out. I would not recommend SANS just because of the expense it's basically a car payment or not a car payment. <laughs> I wish it was that low. It's, it's a car. 
It's about six to eight grand, you know, I, and it's undeniable that their stuff is excellent, but I would not uh, pay for that until you know exactly what it is that you want to do. And it's directly sounds like a certif- sounds like a good certification to get when your employer. Yeah. Once you are established and you're making big bucks, then go get that certification. If you're paying for it yourself, I really don't recommend paying for it yourself. I recommend just <laughs> having your employer pay for it, you know? Yeah, absolutely. No. And you know, what are some advice you have for people studying for this certification, like the different training methods out there? Is there anything you know, that can, you know, that you recommend that helps people study and learn these certifications quicker and absorb the information better? Yeah. So figure out what works for you. I'm a visual learner myself. Watching videos really helps, um, muscle memory, doing hands-on labs afterwards. One of the reasons why, you know, I joined I and E was because they very, very specifically focused on hands-on labs, hands-on education, hands-on learning. Um, I would also say though, that there's nothing wrong with a little repetition. Um, flashcards work really well, but what I've found is that it's not necessarily the flashcards themselves, the repetition of going through those, but it's building them yourselves and not digitally. If you write down hand jam, all of your flashcards yourself, and then you start going through them you've already written them. So you generally will remember them a lot better. Um, That would be for stuff that you have to know the, the technical topics and subjects and things like that. Port numbers, protocols, stuff like that. Exactly. Exactly. I mean, and, um, don't try and learn it all in two weeks, you know, jamming it, drinking from the fire hose. You're just going to data dump everything. (laughs) Um, definitely take your time, take your patience. When I passed the CSSP, uh, it took me six months of tri- of regular study, sitting down, reading, you know, I, I would say I was probably spending about 10 to 20 hours a week of just studying regularly. That's what you got to um, do sometimes, you know? Yeah. Yeah. Well, I mean, CSSP is also, it's, it is literally a, a textbook worth of information that you're trying to study. So, but yeah, I would, I would definitely say, take your time, make, you know, give yourself plenty of time, practice it retain it, go take your test, make sure that the target of your, you know, the target of the cert that you're trying to take directly involves the job that you're trying to do. You know, um, if you're, if you're not going to be working in, in, uh, reverse engineering, there's no point in going and taking reverse engineering just to say you have it, you know, um, at least, at least not for your first one. I know a lot of people that do it as a hobby and if they enjoy doing that, then, you know, good on them. Um, nothing wrong with it. Just, you know, focusing your efforts really helps because everybody gets into tech and they want everything shiny and everything's good. And I want to do eight certs, 10 certs, 12 certs. Oh yeah. And you know, I, I feel that having multiple certifications without the work experience can be a big red flag for some employers. Um, what do you think about that? Yeah, I, I think it can. I really do think it can. Um, I have, I have recommended people for a position that had, you know, six, eight certs after their name on LinkedIn and talked to my, you know, my, uh, previous coworkers and found out that they weren't great they they didn't have the appropriate experience and though they had done all these certifications and stuff like that they couldn't apply any of the knowledge no and so let's let's break this down you know you've decided your career path you know you what you want to what your career goal is you mm-hmm. start studying for your certifications you know uh, or whatever certification you need for that what is the next step you know that people need to do to be able to actually start getting those interviews and landing those jobs so i would say Finding some form of mentor because you need somebody to take a look at your resume that you're sending in. Um, You need somebody that knows the ins and outs. What should I flag that's good and important? What should I leave? Um, And you could find them through professional community. I mean, social media is everywhere now. So there's plenty of areas that you can find somebody that has some experience in this stuff and will take you on. Um, Sans that, start applying. You know, if you've got your, you've got your certs, you've got your foot in the door somewhere, start applying, constantly apply. I would caution about if you get your first job, you got to stay there at least a year. 
Oh, absolutely. Yeah, you had don't, especially in your early career, don't jump from position to position to position. That is a pretty easy red flag, um, especially three years on. If I see if I see somebody that has three or four years of experience and they've been in three or four positions, I'm probably not going to hire them just because they're not going to last twelve months. You know, to an employer, what they see is that you know they see okay, this person is long enough to build the experience and then instantly bail ship on something a better offer or something. Mm. And why take the time and investment? Because it costs a lot of money to train up someone yeah. in a certain position. Um, and just to have them jump ship and have to retrain. Absolutely. So I, th- I feel like a lot of people that are first entering the job market seem to miss out on an understanding of opportunity loss. So opportunity loss is, you know, to have you come in and train up and then do the job, which takes a little bit of time and it's rough. And then by the time you get efficient, if you jump jobs, I then have to train somebody else up and that process is now inefficient again. And I lose opportunity of building on that process and improving it and adding something in there. You know, there's, there's something to be said about, you know, building in there. Um, We also lose as far as the individual as an opportunity, you lose to put your name on something that you've built, right? It's not always, you know, you, you talk, I think you mentioned manufacturing earlier, you know, it's not always a manufacturing line, these processes, there is a human element to things. And when you get good at your job and you become efficient at it, that's when you get the opportunity to work on new projects, to fill your 40 hours a week, to build things yourself, to put your name on processes or initiatives or whatever else. Right. Absolutely. You know, when I landed my very first job in the IT field, I was a IT support specialist, which is a broad mm-hmm. term, I think, for jack of all trades. Yeah, and yeah, it is. It, when I first, where I first started out, I was doing just help desk. You know, resetting AD passwords, creating email accounts. Mm-hmm. My job in the two years there evolved. Where by the time I left the organization, still the same job title and everything, I was designing the complete IT infrastructure for all our brand new hotels we were building, and yep. you know, not just seeing it from conception, designing, mapping you know, planning access points and, you know, um, signal penetration through different materials. Then I had actually go on site and mount and rack the switches and take complete ownership from, you know, conception to production of that yeah. entire network. And, you know, that's what something great to put on your resume is, you know, being involved in those projects and seeing them all the way through. Another great thing is once you start building experience and, you know, you've kind of gotten into the role of your job is starting being involved in community projects. So one big thing I did a lot is I was really into Cisco Meraki product line and I would participate in their community forum. And I wrote several uh, PowerShell scripts to make um, like their SSL VPN installation process a lot easier. Matter of fact, I got a, a trophy over here from Cisco, Meraki, for participating in their community so much. Um, but being able to talk about those things during interviews and with future employers goes a tremendous way, I think. And, you know, really kind of shows pride and ownership of your job. And you can't get that when you're job hopping like every other year. Yeah. Um, you know, it, it is talked about a lot in the IT field. If you want to make the big bucks, you're going to have to job hop. But to a certain degree, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Um, You know, when you're first starting out in the field, your second job is kind of expected almost. I feel like you're only going to do a year or two at that very entry level job. And then you're going to move on to another role, whether that's promotion or just going into a different field. But after that, you, you should really try to settle in and really create that long-term career plan um, for, for success. I think. I'd agree with that. And I'd also think that you need to evaluate, your next moves strategically, you know, it's not just about money at that point. I mean, you, you need to take a look at the career opportunity. What am I going to learn? What am I going to be doing? You know, um, work can get really boring if you already know how to do everything. Absolutely. And that's, that's the reason why I got into technology. Um, I was making really good money as a, I was a bulldozer operator right before I got into tech. Mm-hmm. I was making, like 80 grand a year sitting on my butt just in an air-conditioned cab all day. Yeah. I was 
bored out of my freaking mind. <laughs> um, you know what I mean? And so I took a $20,000 a year pay cut to get into tech uh, yeah. just because I knew I enjoyed it. And, you know, I've progressed in my career and my goals have changed as I've grown in my career. You know, originally I wanted to be like a network or system administrator. I oversaw and became a director of network operations. So uh, now I'm creating new career goals where I'm really enjoying teaching tech now. So I'm starting to go down that career journey. But, you know, it's I forgot where I was going with that rant. <laughs> but, you know, it's it, you need to have the big picture in mind. And it helps if you when you're first getting into the career field, if you have that, like you know, like I want to be a system administrator. This is what I got to do to become that. It makes the career journey so much more enjoyable. And it makes it from just going to work to put food on the table to going to work because you're really excited about working in what you do. And I think for a lot of people, that's a, yeah, you know, the people that are in this field for that because they're excited about tech, they're constantly learning. Those are going to be the people who are going to succeed the most and, you know, have, have the most joy in their life. Yeah. I, I'd agree with that. I, I think that that's, um, yeah, I, I think that we, uh, you know, as individuals, generally speaking, it, it's good to have challenges. It's good to have career goals, things that are smart. Um, and I think that it helps to sit down every couple of years and plan out the next steps and your career choices. I mean, even when you go entry level, you don't always have to go big step, big step, big step. Like you don't have to go from working on, you know, heavy, heavy equipment operator to, okay, now I'm going to be sock level one analyst. Like sometimes the pivot doesn't have to be that help desk to sock level one makes sense. You could go all, all sorts of things. So yeah, I, I think it's, um, it's, it's one of those things when you, when you turn around on that mountain of life and you look back and see all the steps you took to get up to there. Right. Absolutely. Every, every step should have a reason behind it. You know, every, it's, it's just a stepping stone in that path. And, mm -hmm. you know, you, you need to seriously sit down and kind of think and plan with about this. And, you know, if, yeah, if, absolutely. You, if you have a family involve your significant other um, and talk about your goals and ambitions, because really I couldn't have been here without, without that, you know, when I decided I'm going to leave my steady job with, and I have three kids at home and a, you know, a roof over our heads. I'm just going to quit and get into cybersecurity. It didn't happen like that. You know what I mean? There was yeah, talk yeah. and planning and, you know, we, there, there's certain aspects like we, I realized I had to relocate because the area I lived in had nothing, you know, uh, mm. for jobs. So that's another thing to consider. But what is one piece of advice that you could give anyone who's looking to make the change? Maybe they're in tech already, already, but looking to get into cybersecurity was that one piece of advice that you wish you knew when you started um it's not a sprint it's a marathon so you know it it doesn't seem like staying up late every single night is going to catch up with you at all it does it really does take care of yourself you know don't don't uh don't cut out the hot the healthy um habits sacrifice for an extra hour of studying or whatever else because um it very very quickly catches up to you um in the long term of things and you know um it, it can it, it's it's about balance so take take your time with your family uh take your time to take care of yourself you know study appropriately but um yeah don't I, I made, I made a couple mistakes whenever my son was first born because I was also going through that year um a whole bunch of college. I think I did 53 credit hours in a 12 month period. Gosh. Yeah, it was a lot. Um, it was with uh, University of Maryland University College and it was online. Um, I was also in that year uh, on 30% travel. So I, I can 100% relate to that because when I first got into the field, I was supposed to be 20% travel, mm -hmm. but I was gone for three months at a time as I was opening up these new hotels. And, yeah. you know, I had really young kids that were learning to walk and stuff and I was missing out on things. And that's why I ended up, you know, changing jobs is because I was tired of that. Um, yeah. So that's a big thing. Yeah. And well, I was also doing the, the college at the same time too. So like my son's first year, I was in the house, but I was hardly there. Yeah. Um, so yeah, when it, I would recommend, I wouldn't recommend that. 
um, I was, I was deadly afraid of leaving the military and not being able to find a job, um, because of the recession, you know, what, what I got into. And, um, I sacrificed a lot of time that I could have spent with him studying and I, I wouldn't recommend it. Um, I would not do that part over again. Um, I think that I, I think that, uh, and I don't recommend others to do it either. I think it's important to have a much better, um, balance in life, you know? Um, and I mean, me, my, my son, my son is, uh, coming up on seven now, so we're good. You know, we, nice. we've gotten, we've gotten closer now, but, <laughs> um, I, th I think, I think that, you know, at that time I, I, uh, um, I, I took, took it for granted. Um, and I don't recommend it. I think that studying is something that you should, I understand the need and the, the drive for all of us to, you know, make a change in our lives for something better. Right. But I think that it's important to make sure that you don't miss out on life as you do so. Very, very good advice. I, I that's mm. some really good advice there. <laughs> <laughs> uh, if people want to connect with you more or find out more about what you do, where can people find you? So I'm across all socials at uh, Sec IT Guy. I also have, um, I believe, I have my websites on Linktree.com or Linktree, which is uh, uh, at Sec IT Guy on there. I'm on uh, LinkedIn as well. Under that, Jack Reedy, you can connect with me on LinkedIn. Um, I hang out over in the Cyber and Security Group on Discord. I'm also just on Discord regularly. And then um you know it Yeah, that's 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 most of it. <laughs> I've we'll make I've sure got and a couple... put links to all those yeah, in yeah. the show notes or the description, but yeah. Okay. Um yeah, the so I also offer mentoring sessions on Fridays, um or Thursdays, I think it is. Uh thirty minutes, you know, to take a look at either resumes or talk about careers or the moves you should make, things like that. So Mentoring is huge in the IT field, um, really in any of the fields, um, IT fields. Um, I, I was actually just doing a coaching call last night and I had someone ask me, um, you know, how do you go find out that mentor? You know, and it can be difficult for, I think, people to find a, a mentor that they can know and trust and stuff. So having, the, you know, knowing that you offer that, you know, to people is just a really great, you know, opportunity for people that are just looking for some advice, you know, like I said, you know, maybe look at the resume and stuff like that. So, yeah. Um, and there's been quite a bit of success. Uh, I'm, I'm happy to say, you know, um, and, uh, I'm just glad to be able to give back. Like I said, when I started out, it was, uh, I mean, a good example of when I went to college, Facebook was still dot edu addresses only to sign up for it. Yep. Like it was social media was not a thing. Um, cyber education online was not a thing. Right. So, now that it's there, it's so popular. It's what, like Amazon's a thing you can go and buy digital books from and learn. Like, you know, being able to have somebody there to talk you through all this education that's available, I think is uh, super beneficial. Absolutely. It, it's almost, you know, information overload sometimes. Um, yes. Like I was saying in the beginning, it's, it can be really difficult to understand who to listen to because, you know, not all the information out there is correct. Um, so, you know, that's, why I created my YouTube channel is just because I wanted to try to give back to that community and bring experts like yourself on the channel to, you know, kind of demystify some of these, you know, things that are out there in the field. No, thanks. I appreciate the opportunity. Absolutely. I really appreciate you taking the time and everyone. I really hope you guys enjoyed this video. Again, if you have any questions at all for Jack or myself, please make sure and leave them in the comments below. I really hope you guys enjoyed today's video and until next time, keep learning. <laughs>